The arrival of the nucleus is one of the most important advances that you have in the three billion, 3.5 billion years of cellular evolution. Right. And you know, what you have to remember is that as you sit here and you, you are actually 3.5 billion years old not uh, 25 or 19 or whatever your age is, right? <laughs> uh, you are that old because you come from a cell of your father and a cell of your mother, right? And the cell of your father comes from a cell of the grandfather and that grand. And you can go back continuously to those cells that developed about 3.5 billion years ago. No new cells have developed since. I would say, um, you know, I have set up a more molecular approach to cell biology, rather than the descriptive approach using electron microscopy that Pallade introduced and Porter and Albert Claude in the, in the 40s. And then I went the next step for a molecular analysis. What are the molecular players and how do they talk to each other? And that's what I started. I knew that if you want to get evidence for that, uh, it would be good to take this entire process uh, and do it in a test tube using cellular components. And then you can fractionate the cellular components, right? And then find out which are the various players. And that was the first condition doing it. I had to have an assay to reproduce the entire process in the test tube. And the key challenge in that assay was the membrane fraction. Every membrane from the endoplasmic reticulum that I isolated didn't work. I worked for two years trying to isolate membranes. I isolated membranes from every animal that is used in the animal house here. Yeah. From pigeons to chicken to mice to rats to guinea pigs. I mean, this is like when you are the Swedish army and you try to take in the 30-year war a German Protestant city, right? And you live, a, you, you camp around the city wall and you try over and over again to shoot and they pour all sorts of hot things and throw things from the city wall upon you. And this is how I felt. I felt like some poor Swede who tries to take a German city in the 30-year war and, you know, and I can't get into the city. And I read an article that dog pancreas is a very good synthesizer of proteins and has the membranes are very good for some reason. I read an article, I said, okay, try again. So I did this and it was on Christmas 1974 that I did this experiment. I go back the next day, poof, it worked. This was my Nobel Prize, four lanes on a gel. A little segment of the protein that tells the protein where to go. I find it utterly elegant and simple, right, and convincing. There's beautiful stuff in science in, in overall, right, but in cell biology, I would say that is really the molecular phase of cell biology was really started by this experiment. Dr. Günther Blögel, your work has laid the foundation for modern molecular cell biology. On behalf of the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute, I warmly congratulate you and I now ask you to step forward to receive your Nobel Prize. You know, to find something that is new 
that provides more excitement than even the Lasker or the Nobel. You know, to find that, there, that you have actually reconstituted a very important process in the test tube and you find the components that are involved and you identify them and you characterize them was much more exciting than receiving a prize. It's not the equivalent excitement that you have when you discover the thing. And that still is why I'm still in science, because I still feel this vibration of a new discovery. There's 1,001 different cancers. And my idea is that if you work on the basic cell biology, you work on all of these diseases at the same time because at some point you have to understand what the molecular dialogues are. I was born in Silesia, which is the easternmost province of the old Germany. And my father was a veterinarian in the village and my mother's family had a very huge farm nearby. We had to flee when I was eight and a half years old. I was never in the city until um, 1945 when um, I suddenly arrived in Dresden um, and it was about a couple of days before the bombing and we came in with this um, um, car that of my father that my older brother was driving. He was only 15 years old and we were all sitting in this car. And suddenly I saw all of these towers and this cupola of the Frauenkirche and I was absolutely enchanted. You know, I've always remained attached to this city because I saw it in a completely intact way. And a couple of days later we were um, at the farm of um, relatives, it was about, you know, 30, 40 miles away from Dresden uh, on the west. And we saw, you know, the, you know the, the planes that came in these armadas of planes that came, uh, you know, towards Dresden in the, at night. And it, the bombing started about 9 o'clock. At 11 or 12 o'clock, it was, it was so light in, our, in this farmhouse that you, you, you thought it was a, a red light, it was not natural light. And so we went out and looked and there was the entire sky was red. And then I saw the city back again uh, when we tried to go back to Silesia and it was just rubble. I mean, I mean you just don't destroy um, the beautiful things. I mean, you don't destroy Amsterdam. You don't destroy Venice ever. These are holy places, right? You know, they are not holy by the church uh, kind of criteria, but in terms of human creativity, they are ensembles that are so perfect that you don't touch them. I um, gave my Nobel Prize money to uh, Dresden for the reconstruction of the Frauenkirche. It's a magnificent the Baroque church, and it's there again. I did not get permission to study in East Germany. There was the idea of the East German regime that um, the children of workers and of farm people, poor farm people, should go to universities. And the children of the um, academics, whatever, or of the bourgeois classes, shop owners and whatever, shouldn't go. So we went to West Germany, one after the other of the children. And then it became very uh, iffy for my father to have all of these children who had gone to West Germany and there were tensions developing that was before the wall. And so before the wall he was erected, he decided to leave and left everything behind and this was very difficult for him because it was the second time that he had to do it. First he left Silesia and left, left the whole house and everything there and puff out and you know never saw it again and then left this wonderful house that we had in Freiburg also never saw it again. I had already gone to various universities uh, in, in Germany and studied medicine and I did my internship in various hospitals and I had to decide what am I going to do and uh, somehow I didn't really like to deal with patients that much to be honest 
And so I decided maybe I'd try a research, a Korean research. Science is the only human endeavor that is for the entire mankind. I mean, music or cultures are local, but science is the only thing that unites all of mankind. And the formula for water is the same in China and than it is somewhere else. What have one has learned in physics and what one has learned in, in biology is something more wonderful and more awe-inspiring than anything one has learned from religion. I mean, it's just fantastic. And I think that is a great reward if you are a scientist, and particularly if you are a biologist.